Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, my name is Dana Pearls, and I'm here with Friends of the Earth, one of the member organizations of Synbio Watch, which is hosting the 2014 speaker series, Critical Conversations on Emerging Technologies. Um, thank you for coming. So we're really excited uh, to bring you tonight's conversation on how private is your DNA um, with UC Berkeley professor emeritus Troy Duster um, on, the, on the end, and Jeremy uh, Gruber with Council for Responsible Genetics, the president, and Milton Reynolds of Facing History and ourselves. Um, and so we're, we're all very excited about this conversation. Um, this is going to explore the, the cutting edge of DNA privacy. Um, and for Friends of the Earth, we work a lot on genetic engineering and genetic manipulation, but that runs the spectrum from plants to people. And what happens when you are, um, when you have DNA that is being accessed, and by whom is it being accessed, and for what purposes, and for whose benefit, and how do we protect our privacy? Can we control what happens with our genetic information? So we're going to be exploring all of those questions today. Um, for those who, if you have friends who are interested and weren't able to make it, this is live streamed. Um, and you can find that on kpfa.org as well as symbiowatch.org. Um, we are going to be having a Q&A after the speakers, and some of you have cards and pens, go ahead and write your comments and questions down, and then we'll collect them, and some of them will be repetitive, and some of them will, will work nicely together. If you don't have a card, we can just take your questions from the audience. Um, and please participate. You know, We really want to generate a lot of dialogue um, around this topic that really is not discussed very much. Um, so I also just want to give you a heads up that this is part of a series, and the next talk is coming up on April 30th, and that's going to be GMOs 2.0, which is Synthetic Biology, Food, and Farmers. Um, that's going to be looking at extreme genetic engineering and how it stands to radically change our food system and what the impacts are on agriculture and uh, the environment and the livelihoods of farmers across the global south. So we hope that you guys continue coming to these series. Um, finally. Um, these talks are free because people like you all keep them for free. Um, so towards the end, we'll be passing hats around. And if you haven't already, um, it would be great to get a donation of some sort so we can keep these things going. Um, I'd like to thank CS Fund um, for their generous support of this series, KPFA and Frank Sterling, who's been really helpful. Uh, Tina Stevens of the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology, who started this series, and Bright Path Video for their great videography. Um, Breast Cancer Action is also here and they're going to be talking about what are some of the things that we can do and what is the information that we have available to be protecting our privacy. So our host tonight is Milton Reynolds, who is the Senior Program Associate with Facing History and Ourselves. Um, it's an organization that works with educators to enhance student civic learning by identifying sources of bigotry and prejudice so not to be taken lightly. Milton has a strong interest in understanding how legacies of collective history manifest themselves in our present society and how the past informs our decision-making processes and shapes institutional practices in the present. So that's very relevant for our conversation today. Um, he specializes in the American eugenics movement and his insights into how history re-manifests itself today in society um, will make him an excellent moderator. So I'm going to give it up to Milton. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate yeah. it. So it's nice to look out and see uh, uh, a full room, actually. I was here last year, and we had quite a few fewer folks. So it's nice to see the room filling up. So uh, welcome. Looking forward to a good evening with you. So to my immediate left, uh, as you've heard, is Jeremy Gruber. Uh, as you must know, he is the president of, and executive director of the Council for Responsible Genetics, but he was also a leader of the successful effort to enact the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act and CalGENA. Uh, he is an author uh, of several books, in particular, Genetic Explanations, Sense and Nonsense, and Biotechnology in Our Lives, and he's working on an upcoming book, The GMO Deception. And the seat next to him is Professor Troy Duster. And uh, Troy is the Emeritus Chancellor's Professor of Sociology and a Senior Fellow at the Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy at the Uni University of California, Berkeley, just up the hill. 
He's also the past president of the American Sociological Association, and he served as a member of the National Council on the Human Genome Project and chaired its committee on, on ethical, legal, and social issues. Uh, his relevant books and monographs include Cultural Perspectives on Biological Knowledge and Backdoor to Eugenics. Uh, recent relevant publications include Ancestry Testing and DNA Uses, Limits and Caveat Emptor, uh, and S. Krimsky and K. Sloan's uh, edition of Race and Genetics Revolution, Science, Myth, and Culture, which was produced by uh, Columbia University Press. So I want to welcome you both. Looking forward to a great exchange tonight. So your, your bios are pretty brief, and so I'd love to get people to get a better sense of who you are and what brought you to this work. So if you could get us started, I'd love to get a sense of how you got traction on these issues and, and why you feel they're important, and that should give us a good launching ramp into tonight's discussion. Sure. Uh, so my first job out of law school was with the ACLU, and one of the wonderful things about working uh, as a young attorney with an organization like the ACLU is, is that there's no learning curve. They throw you into the deep end of the pool almost right away. They don't have the resources to, to move you up uh, little by little. And as a result, uh, at the time I joined, there was this fledgling issue that uh, they thought somebody should look into, but they didn't really know anything about, called genetic privacy. Um, and so within weeks, of joining the ACLU, that was uh, the issue that I was handed to to be sort of the organization or become the organizational expert around. And so almost immediately in my career, I began working on these issues. Um, and I started working uh, first on state legislation uh, to address genetic non-discrimination. And then eventually in the mid-1990s, uh, we got uh, what became the first draft of the Genetic Information on Discrimination Act, which is a federal law we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a little bit. Um, it introduced in 1995, and it took 13, <laughs> excuse me, it took 13 years, but we eventually passed that federal law. It's the only federal uh, genetic protection law in the country. Um, and, uh, and as a result of passing that law, I came to be working on genetics almost as a full-time issue. Uh, so when an opportunity came to, to actually do this with CRG and work on genetics issues in a much more broader sense. It was a, it was the right timing. So I came to CRG in 2009. I've been continuing to work on genetic privacy issues. Uh, we host uh, the G California Genetic Privacy Network, which is a project that we do along with the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology. It's genetic, geneticprivacynetwork.org, which has a lot of information that we'll be talking about tonight. And, uh, and, and so this has really been one of my the fundamental issues that I have worked on and that as uh, CRG has actually worked on as well for many years. I'll try to keep this short. There's a long trajectory to my interest in the topic. Uh, years ago, I was working on the history of the opiates, in particular social uses, political uses of morphine and heroin in the 19th century and then how it, uh, its trajectory into the 20th century uh, moved along class and racial lines. Um, when that book was published, I was invited to join the NIH Advisory Committee, which gives out, gives out money, uh, people seeking research grants. So I was in an orbit of people who were in this world of grant giving. Because of that experience, in the late part of the Carter administration, I was then invited to join an advisory group which was going to advise the Institutes of Health in Washington on the allocation of research funding. So this group contained psychiatrists, biochemists, psychologists, uh, people from different points of view, uh, and came, of course, with their own agendas about how the government should be allocating resources. And that's when I had my epiphany, because I understood in that very short period of about six months of how deeply interested people are in getting funding for their particular work version of what goes on in society. And, and now more specifically, I heard for the first time how people in the, uh, psychiatry who were, wanted to think of mental illness in terms of genetics and biochemistry, how strongly they felt 
And indeed, they began to talk about the issue of funding for research in mental health in such visceral and mean-spirited terms that I was taken aback. They, they kept saying things like concerns about poverty and social forces that explain bipolar and schizophrenia are complete and total nonsense. The real issues are biochemical and genetic. So depression, alcoholism, uh, even drug addiction, which I knew something about, uh, they wanted to put in this category called genetics. So I was forced to go back and look at the sources of their certainty. And it turns out that it was, of course, remarkably overstated. The claims making about the genetics of schizophrenia, for example, were extraordinarily puffed up. Um, the father of this field was called, his name was Seymour Ketty. And Ketty just had this strong view that the NIH, NIMH monies going for anything else besides genetics were a waste of the taxpayer's money. All right, so then I began to become self-educated. I went back and spent perhaps a year and a half, two years, looking at the history of this whole phenomena of genetic explanations, which took me back into the 19th century and, of course, into the whole issue around eugenics. So then I worked on this topic for a few years, and having published that book, I was invited to then join, as you just heard, the National Human Genome Research Project as a member of the advisor, advisory committee. And in that role, once again, I began to hear what I call the genetic determination, the, the genetic deterministic view about all kinds of issues. And it was not just mental health now, mental illness, but uh, a whole range of issues. So that's the, the quick history. There's more to be said. But back to you. So I know that there was a lot of uh, belief that the Human Genome Project would actually put an end to these ideas of uh, innate human differences and was going to, you know, launch us into a, into a, into a new future. And so I, I'm curious, why, why didn't that happen? Uh, well, uh, the first 10 years of the project, it did happen. From 89 to 99, the overwhelming, what, conventional wisdom within the Human Genome Project was that anybody's genomic structure would do. It didn't matter who you mapped and sequenced. We're all so much alike at the DNA level that race would become irrelevant. And indeed, by 2000, the famous press conference with, at the White House with uh, Francis Collins, who was the director of the project in the public sector, and Craig Venter in the private sector, they got together with uh, the president and Tony Blair, and they concluded uh, in unison that race was no longer an issue. We were only, quote, one human race. That was 2000. Unfortunately, for this sequence of events, that same year, we began to get publications which talked about the ways in which, although we were 99.9% .9 alike, this 0.1% difference meant that there were 3 million points of difference between any two people in the world. So with 3 billion base pairs, 99.9% .9 seems overwhelming. But just 0.1%, and here's the example they would use, uh, just 0.1%, even one small little fragment of the DNA could make you into someone who had a blood disease called hemophilia, or Tay-Sachs, or sickle cell anemia. So this issue that only 1% is at issue um, began to become problematic. And this opened up the doors to the pharmaceutical companies, which began very quickly to explore these points of difference, these 3 million single nucleotide polymorphisms and more, to talk about the ways in which different drugs might have different impacts on different people. Now, that was to usher in a concept called personalized medicine. But here's the irony. Uh, drug companies are interested in markets, not individuals. And so the whole framing of the issue of personalized medicine would quickly transmogrify into a concern for s population genetics. And that's the beginning of the road down which we headed in 2002, 2003, and we've been very much there ever since. So on the one hand, we have the first 10 years of the project. We're all the same, 99.9% .9 alike, and that's true. But then in 2001, we get the supercomputers moving into this whole zone of looking at di differentiation, and the basis of that will be patterns of drug use for certain populations. And that, uh, many of you will know this story. Just quickly, what happened in 2005, the, the, F the FDA approved uh, a drug designed for African-Americans called Bidil. It was a 
drug, which was a combination of uh, drugs which would supposedly help African Americans, uh, and less so Asians and whites. So that was the beginning of this whole development. We've seen more in the last few years. There's something called ERESA, a late-stage cancer drug, which, like the, the drug for uh, African Americans, had, had failed in a large clinical trial, but it was successful in Asian Americans. Increasing their lifespan for about six to 12 months, it's a late-stage cancer drug. But once this, com this, com this company, AstraZeneca, found that out, they, of course, moved their whole apparatus into the Asian sphere, where there's a huge market, and that's the beginning, then, for the whole notion of the shift from personalized medicine to racialized medicine. <clears throat> I, th I think it's important to note, um, when we start talking more about genetic privacy, you know, this is really the first time that we've dealt uh, with a, a, a discrimination issue, a privacy issue, that didn't, that wasn't about a particular group. You know, every time we've passed a civil rights law in this country's history, it was to protect a particular group. You have Title VII uh, of, the, of the Civil Rights Act uh, protecting uh, African Americans and, and, and based upon race and, and, and uh, national origin. And then, of course, you had Americans with Disabilities Act uh, and you have ADEA, the Ameri uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Each one of these non-discrimination uh, non laws uh, that have been passed have all been to protect a particular group that was being singled out for discrimination. What makes genetic privacy and genetic discrimination uh, so concerning is that we have now dispensed with it's somebody else. When we talk about genetic privacy, when we talk about genetic discrimination, it's all of us. It's everyone in this room. It's every, it's every one of your family members. We are all at risk for genetic discrimination. We are all at risk for having our privacy uh, 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 implicated uh, in some way or form. And it's already happening. How, how many of you think you're on, on a DNA database right now? Well, if you were born after 1970, you are. In the state of California and in every state, when you are born, state public health departments conduct newborn screening programs. And to do that, uh, they take a, a heel prick, a blood spot, to run uh, tests for certain inherited conditions. And those tests, every year, they're adding more and more tests to, to, uh, uh, to be conducted. Once those t tests are finished, and most people don't know this is going on. The consent procedures are horrible. Most states don't require consent. Uh, most people, you're, you're in the hospital. You're ha you've just had a baby. You have no idea what's going on. You're signing every form that they put in front of you. Um, and in most states, once they finish running those tests, those, that information then goes to the State Department of Public Health and stays there. In fact, in the state of California, it stays there indefinitely. State of California maintains the newborn blood spots forever. So, and, and of course, when we talk about DNA, it's important to talk about, you know, we're not just talking about information about ourselves. We're saying, you know, a lot of people are, uh, talk about, well, why is DNA accepted from medical information? Why isn't it, why don't we just talk about medical information? Well, DNA is different because we're not just talking about information about ourselves, about our health history, about our ancestry, about our identity, our paternity, but we're talking about information for our family today and for future generations. So it's a very robust form of information. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, all the opportunities for where uh, this information might be out there. Uh, but we're already on, on databases. So if everybody has a potential to be discriminated against by virtue of some of these new technologies and the, and the ability to sort of have access to the data, then it seems like it would be easier to pass legislation. and based on your earlier comments, it doesn't seem like that's the case. And so I'm wondering, is, is, is the pushback from um, pharmaceutical companies who have a, a, a vested interest in, in creating new markets, or is it a lack of public understanding of knowledge, or what, what contributes we're, to those difficulties? We're in an era of big data, uh, where, where biological science has moved to a point where we've stopped focusing on 
traditional, the traditional scientific method. You have a hypothesis, and you set out to prove or disprove that hypothesis. We've now moved into an era of big data where the idea is that we are going to get more and more information, in this case, genetic information. And the larger the data sets are, the more likely, as is uh, proffered, more likely we are to find correlations among the data that's going to lead to some new discovery. The problem is, is that the correlation and causation are not the same thing. Uh, and we can find in the larger and larger the data sets, and we see this in very different types of data sets, um, even in forensic sets, data sets, when we have large databases, we'll find matches that aren't, exact, aren't always matches. Uh, and it's the same thing with medical research. You have a large data set, you look for, for uh, connections, um, and you might very well find it. A very good example um, is that there's uh, uh, certain genes that they have, that they have done research on, uh, behavioral research on. But the problem is, is that the data sets that they use are very limited. They're robust, but they're very limited to specific types of genes where they have the information about the gene expression, and then they also have information about the personal history of the individuals uh, that are uh, related to it. And so they, they're fi they find correlations all the time for, uh, uh, for certain genes uh, that the, for which they have not been able to actually replicate those findings later. We see that all the yeah. time. You can't pick up a newspaper now where you don't see a headline saying they found the gene for this or they found the gene for that. And it tr turns out that the human body is far more complex than they ever give it credit for. Uh, that there are uh, thousands of genes that work together uh, and with themselves, with the environment, uh, the idea uh, that they're going to find direct connections is not, it's just bad science, but it's what's going on now. Well, I want to go back to the question about newborn screening, because uh, I think that it's, it's important to indicate why it is that many people are in favor of collecting genetic information. It turns out that there are good reasons for newborn screening. Let's take the case here in California where we now are able to determine in that first few weeks whether or not the newborn has any of a number of possible genetic defects. And if, for example, it's the classical case of phenylketonuria, one can actually alter the diet and help the infant along. Or let's say uh, sickle cell anemia, which is uh, much more likely to occur in African-American populations. Uh, 30 years ago, before newborn screening was so popular, uh, we didn't know what to do, and now there are ways of intervening in those first few years uh, to affect uh, in a positive way. So I think one of the things we have to talk about here is the way in which there's a balancing act and sometimes how that balancing act is distorted. Now, the question of access. So I think what Jeremy is referring to is the collection of large-scale data. Um, and this is happening all over, not just, of course, in medical contexts, but in volunteering of your DNA, where people will send in their DNA to, one, to a company and get back information about what they think to be the probabilities that if they have a particular genetic structure, they will are more likely to have some kind of either genetic disorder or maybe they'll have something that's positive. So now the question is access. So as we've, we've all in indicated, DNA is out there. Uh, it's also in there in terms of these our databases. A few years ago, uh, Jeremy may remember this, the front page of the, I think it was Time Magazine, called Genome-Wide Association Studies, the New Technology for the Next Decade. And it was the technology which he described. You simply uh, have huge databases, and then you ask the computer to find patterns which might indicate whether or not this particular frequency on this allele produces prostate cancer or breast cancer. So you, this was f four or five years ago, the technology of the future. It has not panned out. So we'd have almost nothing coming out of GWAS studies, as they're called, which is translated into uh, medical interventions. So unlike newborn screening, these genome-wide association studies have not produced the same kind of outcomes positively that one might have hoped for. But I want to t turn to another other issue about who has access to your DNA. Um, in the beginning, 30, 35 years ago, the only legitimate access to your DNA was if you had committed a sex crime and were convicted. The authorities were entitled to take your DNA and store it. The idea was that you were likely to be a recidivist, 
and if you're a sex criminal, chances of you're leaving some biological sample at the, at the scene was high enough. And so there was general uh, agreement around the country. We, uh, we keep the DNA of sex criminals who are convicted. In a very short period, we began to collect the DNA of violent criminals, uh, homicides and armed robbers. And then we moved to just burglars and car thieves. And uh, now we're collecting the data of people who ride bicycles on sidewalks. So what's happened in the last uh, 20, 30 years is this remarkable function creep. Starts off with sex offenders. And now in California, uh, I think Jeremy mentioned this, that we passed a law in 2004 permitting the keeping of the DNA of arrestees and some of them for misdemeanors. In many states, and here's where I'll turn it over to you, this is your area, how many states now collect DNA on arrestees? About 28 states now collect DNA from people who are arrested but not convicted of a crime. So these are people who are sensibly innocent until proven guilty. Um, and uh, the, one of the, the major problems is that even if those people uh, are not convicted, most states do not have automatic expungement policies. So it's up to the individual, and it can be very difficult and very time consuming uh, and costly to do, uh, it's up to the individual oftentimes to try to get their DNA expunged from the system. Uh, this happened uh, just uh, in California. There's a, a case that's still winding its way through the courts, the Haskell v. Harris case, which is a good example of, uh, uh, of, of how this could affect you. You know, a lot of times when we talk about police and DNA, it's always the other. But, uh, but the police practices have become so pervasive in terms of their collection. In the Haskell case, uh, there was a, a, a woman who was protesting in San Francisco and had her DNA collected when she was arrested. Um, she was never charged, uh, and her DNA is still in the system. And the, the case has been winding its way through the courts now for some time. Um, and this is where we're going. Uh, in fact, in the United Kingdom, it, uh, which is sort of uh, a good example of where we, where we may very well be going um, if we do not turn course. In the United Kingdom, uh, they were collecting the DNA of people for people who are arrested and people who are convicted of even the most minor crimes. And these were, there were cases where, uh, uh, and they were collecting the DNA of minors as well. There were cases where individuals, uh, where a boy would, would kick a soccer ball into somebody's lawn and they'd collect his DNA. It took a European Court of Human Rights decision uh, to actually force the U UK government to start to dial back their collection policies. Unfortunately, in this country, so far at least, the court cases that we've had, we had a, a very recent case decided by the US Supreme Court, the Maryland v. King case, uh, that uh, allowed, that found uh, that while the taking of DNA upon arrest was a, a Fourth Amendment search, it was allowed uh, uh, under, they found it constitutional to take DNA upon arrest because they saw DNA as the same as a fingerprint, as fundamental as a fingerprint, and they did not do any of the analysis to, sh to, to explore how DNA is actually a far more robust form of information than a fingerprint. Equally importantly, and what most people don't appreciate, is that when you take DNA from anybody who is arrested, convicted, any, anybody who the police are interacting with, when they take your DNA, they create what's a, a profile of that DNA that goes on the CODIS database, that's the federal database. That's a computerized uh, uh, profile of your DNA, but they still keep that biological sample. And it's, those are kept by uh, the states, and in me most cases, those are kept indefinitely. So the states are maintaining those biological samples, which could be used for other purposes ostensibly. Um, and that is per perhaps one of the greatest privacy concerns that we have today, is that they're collecting more and more uh, DNA, creating profiles that go on the, data, uh, on the federal database, but then maintaining those biological samples. And they're finding more and more opportunities to collect that DNA. Uh, the police, for example, in Orange County, California, uh, were actually stopping uh, individuals uh, for very minor crimes. Um, and uh, offering them the opportunity, we'll let you go. We won't, we won't even take you down to the station and book you. We'll let you go, but you have to give us a DNA sample. Oh, wow. Well, I, I wanted to comment on this question of uh, 
How many in the audience have ever heard of the term a cold hit? A cold hit, okay. Now the reason why this is an important issue is because these massive databases are kept and stored in a particular uh, file or lab, and then there's a crime scene. Now you've all seen CSI. Everybody knows what CSI is. That's where you can watch on television. They go to the crime scene, they find the DNA, they go back to this laboratory with all the co white-coated scientists, and they got you, right? That's the end of the story. Well, it turns out that that's sometimes uh, referred to as a cold, a cold hit comes in the following way. Um, there's a huge database now. Over 10 and, and a half million people are now in the national forensic database um, convicted. And there's another million and a half or so who are in um, a file of what's called a forensic database. They don't know who did it, but they've got the DNA. So what happens is that, uh, and here in California we do this every Monday morning, uh, they, they take the take a DNA from a crime scene and they put it in the computer and they try to get a match to this huge database. And when they find a sufficient number of hits, connected tissue, uh, they, the, the samples show that this particular DNA at this crime scene or that they have now connects up to this huge database. They say, we've got a hit. From that cold hit, they sometimes will then go out and try to arrest someone, try to find out who the, who the person is, or in many cases, this person will have enough DNA to indicate that they may have a family member who should be the person of arrest. So these databases are not simply neutral, and here's where we come to issues of stratification, class, and race, because it will not surprise you to learn that the overwhelming number of people in the national forensic database are people of color. And that has to do with the way in which we've had a drug war for now 35 years, and that drug war goes into communities of color more than into and onto, let's say, a campus. Now, uh, one of the last times I heard of a campus raid was University of Virginia about 25, 30 years ago. They went onto the campus and they found that there was a cocaine ring, and uh, 12 were arrested. The next day, newspapers in that region were very critical of the police. Why? Because they said, there's real crime on the streets, and you're going onto a college campus to arrest people? So you see the distortion in the way in which this whole thing unfolds. Who gets arrested has to do with forces which are social and political, as opposed to whether who's committing the crime. So that, that's the extreme case. But I want to point this out because it has to do with what we, I think we should then talk about, which is um, abandoned DNA. So now the question is, who has access to your DNA? Who has access to it? Well, <clears throat> the courts have held in, in the last five to six years that when you throw out your trash, you have no presumption of privacy. So people can go into your trash, look through it, and find more information out about you. Um, and they've now ruled that Abandoned DNA is in the same category. Now, it turns out that we abandon our DNA wherever we are. Here's the irony. There is a Fourth Amendment which says the police are required to have a search warrant to go into your home, but no search warrant to go into your DNA. This is important because the ways in which the laws were written go back 200 years, Fourth Amendment, access to your home, access to your written word through the mail. It's a felony to open up your mail, written mail, but who writes letters these days? It's all email. Um, it's, a it's a crime to wiretap a landline, but again, who uses landlines as much as we now use mobile phones? The laws do not reflect the changes. That is, Fourth Amendment rights are there. You have to have a warrant to get into your home, but no warrant to do tapping of your cell phone, no warrant um, with your email, as we know from the NSA. So the laws are out of congruence with the reality. Again, no reason why someone should be able to access your DNA and then search it without a warrant. 
Abandoned DNA, it's everywhere. It's on this glass. Uh, you leave a hair follicle, you've abandoned your DNA. In other words, access and privacy um, could be gone just with the notion of abandoned DNA. And it's not just a law enforcement issue. <clears throat> when we talk about abandoned DNA, it's important to, to note uh, that in most states, it's legal for you as a citizen to take abandoned DNA and use it to test for paternity, to test for health predispositions. Um, in fact, there's a company, uh, there's several companies, uh, in, even in California, that do direct-to-consumer testing, which we might want to talk about in a little bit. Um, one of which, in particular, in San Diego, actually uh, invites people to send in articles of clothing, glasses, cigarette butts, and it gives them full explanations as to how to package it. And you can send this in, and they will sequence the DNA. Uh, and so you can learn about information about, about your fellow citizens uh, in, in completely legally. Um, I think it's important to talk about where we do have protections. Um, unfortunately, we, we, they're not, we, we have no comprehensive genetic privacy law in this country. Um, and while the laws, as we've talked about in the forensic area and police use of DNA, uh, have, have not uh, been protective of privacy and human rights, we have had some success in passing laws protecting genetic information in other contexts. Um, it's important to note right off, when we talk about, we've been talking about DNA, and we talk about it uh, uh, as if DNA and genetic information are the same thing. But there are other forms of genetic information, and perhaps the most common form of genetic information still today is your family history. We, when you go to the doctor, most of us uh, will never, uh, in the near future even, deal with whole genome sequencing. They're, they're starting to do more whole genome sequencing uh, with cancer and, and other particular conditions. But if you, as an average person going into your general practitioner, will never have whole genome sequencing. Um, but uh, if you uh, uh, go into your general practitioner, you will likely will give a family history. Right? You talk about that all the time. Every time you get a new doctor, they want to know your family history of this, your family history of that. And that is in your medical record. And your, predis your family history of conditions that are considered hereditary is genetic information. Um, and, uh, and as a result of those types of concerns, uh, that's what led to our, uh, uh, our work on the federal GINA law, uh, which was passed in 2008, enacted in 2009. Uh, it does protect against the acquisition of genetic information in the context of health insurance and employment. Um, it is not a perfect law, and there are exceptions. Um, uh, the state of California is actually the only state that has actually gone further and built upon the protections in GINA, uh, passing a law called CalGINA in 2011 uh, that includes a, a whole host of other areas uh, where potential discrimination might occur, everything from mortgage lending to education circumstances to housing um, to other forms of insurance, life, long-term care, and disability insurance. Or, types of insurance where uh, predictive information is highly sought after. Um, but even with CalGINA, uh, there are still plenty of areas that remain unprotected, uh, where your genetic information is available, it is out there, and where you do not necessarily have control over it. Uh, and we can perhaps talk about some of those areas. You know, One is, uh, which Troy mentioned uh, earlier, um, was uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing. This is an industry uh, that uh, has come about, came about about seven years ago, uh, and their mantra is, you know, you know, you have a right to your DNA. Send us your DNA, and we'll provide certain predictive information about it. Well, this, th there are uh, some very uh, strong concerns about how accurate the information that they're actually giving is, um, but in terms of privacy, uh, Something very interesting has happened. When these companies first came uh, uh, came online about seven years ago, the tests were relatively expensive. Uh, 23andMe, which is the largest of these companies, uh, was offering a test for $399. Today, their test is $99. So the question is, well, 
how have their costs gone so low? What's happened? Uh, have they innovated so much that they're able to, to offer uh, their test at 25%? Well, of course not. What's happened is, is that they realized that there was only a finite number of people willing to pay money for information that just really wasn't that useful. They were taking this information to their doctors, and the doctors were saying, you know, it's, it's interesting, but there's not a lot I can do with this. Um, this isn't sufficiently uh, uh, meaningful clinically for me to be able to use this type of information. And as these companies uh, quickly found out, uh, they just weren't making enough money, and they were losing money. So what they decided is, well, we're going to change our business model. So we're still going to tell you that we're offering a fee for service, but what we're actually doing is building a massive database, a massive database that we now own uh, about your information. So you're not just offering a fee for service. You're basically gets, giving them your genome and paying them to databank bank it and to look for opportunities to monetize that information through research uh, and other methods. And so we're starting to see more and more databases, both public and private, creep up, and this is just one of those opportunities. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, I work with schools, and off, I work with a number of high schools in which they do the spit test or the epithelial skin swab test, and so I assume in their they're both feeding into those databases, but maybe they actually represent a market in and of themselves. Now, I don't know whether the students have to do any sort of um, parental permission slip, but I should ask about that. But what are some of the implications of bringing these technologies down to that level, down to a high school level? And then the other thing I want to sort of float is we had, there was a, an article that was floating around about that French school in which a female student had been raped, and so the school went about, I, to collect the data, the, the genetic data, of all the male students and all the male staff. Um, and so as we begin to look at the, the creep of these, uh, of these technologies, what are, what are some of your concerns? Well, some of you may remember, it wasn't too long ago, uh, 2010, uh, the Bring Your Genes to Cal uh, uh, testing that was, going, that was proposed at, uh, at Berkeley. And what this program was, uh, was anytime you have an incoming freshman class, there's always some sort of summer program where they offer you some sort of a project to do over the summer and then you come to school, you're an incoming freshman and you come to school and you use whatever you did over the summer to learn something new. It's a way of sort of introducing you to university life and building, uh, building community. Well, in 2010, the University of California uh, at Berkeley, right here, uh, sent incoming students a spit kit, uh, essentially for use as uh, to, to do a, a program on genetics and genetic testing. But they didn't tell the students anything about how this information might be used beyond simply telling them, sending them the kit and telling them how to spit into a tube and send it to them. And, and even worse, not only were they not telling the students uh, 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 much about the program, they really didn't know themselves know much about the program. They hadn't figured out how they were going to maintain the samples when they got them. They hadn't figured out uh, how uh, and if they were and under what circumstances they were going to destroy the samples. And what ended up happening after uh, myself and Troy and some of the others and the people in the audience and, and the public in general, uh, there was an outcry. Um, was the State Department of Health, Public Health, in the state of California got involved. 23, 23andMe was very much behind 23 and 23andMe had been, initially actually had been involved. They were going to do the testing. Right. This is one of the direct consumer testing companies. They were going to do the testing and they were going to offer as a prize uh, additional testing to whoever uh, uh, might, might, might do well in the program. Um, but the State Department of Health ended up closing off part of the program because they weren't even operating it properly. They were going to do the testing on campus in laboratories that were not properly designated to do the testing. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the question about um, um, GINA, the Genetic Information on Discrimination Act, and Jeremy is correct. It does provide some protection. However, there is a huge loophole. You may have read the newspaper about a week ago. Someone uh, refused to permit DNA to be collected and analyzed because he was afraid that his insurance company would uh, be prohibited. Now, so this Genetic Information Act does pro prohibit employers from using genetics to discriminate. You cannot use genetics and say you can't have a job. Uh, 
And it does mean that insurance companies can't deny you insurance. But an insurance company having information about your genetics could raise the price to a prohibitive level. That's a loophole. Um, and it's a significant one. Uh, we're talking about the cost of these genetic tests. Uh, they're down to about $1,000 now. So people can get them. Um, but I, I want to move to a, a futuristic imagery. And uh, Dana, this is the time. <laughs> Click. Okay. Right. Um, one of the things people like to say is, well, DNA is like a fingerprint. It's just information that uh, can be used to identify you. Well, um, there's something called molecular, molecular photo fitting. And what's happening now is there, there are companies which are trying to use DNA to go into the particular sequence to determine whether or not you can, I'll use hair color because they've got that right. You can actually determine whether from the DNA that sample indicates that the phenotype will be a redhead. So redheads, be very careful at crime scenes. We don't, we, we don't have it for blondes or brunettes. We've got it for redheads. Now, here's the situation. These companies are now trying to determine from your DNA what the particular configuration of the phenotype would be, almost always the face now. We're talking about uh, nose structure, high cheekbones, not just hair color. And the claims making is out there, as it was th many years ago on this topic. But now, you, you, you will see here that these patterns are, are now being called phenotypical s service. And guess who's interested? The police. And the police are interested for, let's put it positively, for a good reason. They want to get the DNA of the crime scene. They want to exclude certain people from a, a dragnet. That's the claim. The problem is that the police also, along with prosecuting attorneys, always want a conviction. So the flip side of exclusion at the crime scene is the creep towards using this kind of information to come to court and say, we now have sufficiently well, this is positive information which will produce a conviction. If you think I'm exaggerating, um, I, I refer you to the National Academy of Sciences full report of four years ago. It's a report about 350 pages thick. And it's all about forensic science claims and courts, which are often, often bogus claims. They'll say this particular hair, hair follicle or this particular uh, blood sample uh, is about 89% correct, or they'll even go to the level of saying it's huge chances of this being the same person. The forensic science uh, work that the National Academy documented is around the country often very, very sloppy, but it does produce convictions. This molecular photo fitting is the future of what happens when your DNA is in the hands of people who want to make a claim of the connection between this and your phenotype. Is there, is there a next, uh, this, this is not actually the best one, is there a next? Scroll down. Scroll, scroll down to, uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, out, other way. Scroll, scroll up. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Now you notice what's happening here. We talked at the very beginning about race as being epiphenomenal in the Human Genome Project. This is the molecular reinscription. From the DNA, here's the attempt to claim that we can now talk about European physiognomy and ancestry all the way to West African. In fact, there's already an artist um, called Heather Dewey Haybrook. She, she's in New York. <clears throat> she uses less sophisticated methods than the molecular photo fitting that, um, that Troy was just speaking about. Um, but she takes abandoned objects, like we, we've talked about abandoned DNA earlier, and creates physical likenesses, masks, based upon those, that abandoned DNA. Um, and they've been, uh, they're, they're, it's not particularly accurate. Um, but, uh, but there is a likeness. And the concern is that, and we all, we all have seen how poor eyewitness accounts can actually be uh, of a crime. We hear all the time people being actually convicted based upon uh, an eyewitness account that turned out to be erroneous. Well, imagine that that eyewitness now is essentially a computer, right? It's not a person anymore, uh, that they've taken the DNA uh, they've created a likeness from it, 
And then they go, go out into the community trying to find someone to match that likeness. So imagine how many people might be erroneously stopped because they bear some sort of resemblance uh, to, that, uh, to that likeness, uh, and how many people might be affected simply in that way. Yeah, one other comment on this use. Um, CSI effect is real, but it's not the kind of reality that you'd think it, because plea bargains are far more likely than jury trials. So most of you understand this, but uh, the general public does not. Jury trials are anomalous. Less than 5% of all convictions go to jury. 95%, and this is across the globe, by the way, are plea bargains. Why is this significant? Because the prosecuting attorney will often come into the room and tell the accused, we have information, we have the data, that Joey in the next room has already confessed, you should confess too. We know that happens, and it's a lie, but they use it. But what happens when you have DNA claims? Well, as research by my colleagues, Prainsack and Kitzberger, they go into the prisons and they ask people about their experience with the DNA claims making. And it turns out that prisoners have more faith that the DNA is definitive than do even prosecutors or the general public. So you have a situation now where the prosecuting attorney goes in and says to this person, we've got your DNA, you might as well confess. And so we're seeing a distortion now uh, as a function of this. So we, we're certainly talking about the present, and I'm wondering about the future. I know back in 1990, uh, when Backdoor to Eugenics was published, some of these things didn't exist, but they exist now. And so sort of, I'm really wondering, are we, are we at that point? Are we crossing the threshold? And more importantly, what are some of the things you see coming down the line in the future that are uh, a source of concern for you? And I, let me throw one more thing in here. And I'm, I'm also wondering, is there a distinction to be made between um, direct-to-consumer, the implications for direct-to-consumer uh, access to these technologies, or are you more concerned about the state-sponsored sort of role in this, I guess I'm wondering? Well, I, I think there's, of course, always a heightened concern when the state is involved. Um, but uh, in terms of future concerns, we're seeing as we talked about earlier, the, this rise of big data, we're seeing larger and larger biobanks of information growing up around the country. One of the largest biobanks in the country actually is in our backyard, is Kaiser Permanente. Um, and uh, they're getting more and more samples. Uh, and the concern, I think, in the future is how are these separate biobanks going to both, both uh, government-run privately run, how and when are they going to start to bleed together? Uh, and when are they going to start interacting? It takes one police chief uh, one time to say, wait a second, I think that John Smith is, is, the, suspect, is the suspect in this case. I can't match him to the sample. I don't have enough evidence to be able to subpoena his DNA, but uh, I know his DNA is in that public health database or it's in that biobank. Uh, and I want to try to access that to try to make a match. It just takes that one bleed over. And I think it's that type of a bleed over um, that's really concerning. You know, we're already starting to see these issues raised in other countries. Um, in the UK, again, in the UK, uh, you have an issue where uh, the public health uh, uh, authorities want to try to put everybody's uh, genetic information in a public database for research. Uh, and I think the concern is that uh, the, a, lo a lot of what we're, s the, the, the positive things that could potentially come from DNA are overwhelming uh, b the balancing of the potential harms. Um, and in many cases, those those positive applications uh, are exaggerated, um, and uh, we're losing sight of any type of an appropriate balancing between privacy concerns, human rights, consent. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, that's particularly alarming to us um, is what people are being told when they participate in clinical trials and in other, and, and, and other types of research where they're giving their DNA samples.
they're being told things about anonymization uh, of DNA which are false. You can't anonymize DNA. It's far too robust a form of information to truly be anonymized. And there's been plenty of work to show it can be re-identified. Um, but that, that consent, um, which may, may, may be appropriate for the first use, may not necessarily uh, 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 further for future uses. That once you give your DNA, that there may be plenty of future uses down the line for that DNA for which you have no control over, for which you aren't even aware of. Uh, and there are plenty of examples where that's already happened. The Havasupai case. The case. This was a case in Arizona where you had a Native American tribe. Um, and uh, Native Americans are uh, uh, particular targets for genetics research because, um, because they have, uh, because their, their lineages can be traced um, uh, very far back. Um, and uh, they were told by the University of Arizona uh, that, their de that they, uh, uh, they were asked to participate in research on diabetes. They had high rates of diabetes in the tribe, and so it was very important for them to try to identify why that might be. So they were very excited when the University of Arizona came to their door and said, well, you know, we want to work with you and we want to help you. Well, several years later, the Havasupai tribe discovered that the University of Arizona researchers had actually been using those samples for a whole host of other projects for which they had never gained consent. Dozens of research projects having nothing to do with diabetes. Um, and uh, it was Schizo only- Schizophrenia. It was only serendipity that the tribe actually found out. They were never told this. Um, and they ended up, up suing and settling with the university. But these are the types of examples where you are told one thing about how your DNA might be taken. These are, these are examples where you are voluntarily giving your DNA. It's not a law enforcement context where it's being taken from you, but you're voluntarily giving your DNA under the assumption that you have an understanding between the, you yourself and the institution taking the DNA, and that understanding is a farce. Uh, there is a complete uh, gap between what people think is happening when they give their DNA for one purpose and what is actually happening uh, many generations later. Yeah, I know we're about out of time, and we want to leave uh, enough for questions and answers. Uh, but before we do that, I'd just like to mention that we were also asked to talk about what people can do. Yeah, right. And um, one of the things I would like to see us do, it sounds a bit phantasmagoric right now, but a search warrant should be required if the state is going to look at your DNA. If the search warrant's required for your, entering your home, uh, and they can, from your DNA, prospectively do molecular photo fitting, there should be a search warrant required by the state, at least, before they can enter into your DNA. And since everybody's DNA is abandoned all the time, <laughs> um, that's not phantasmagoric. Uh, but you may have an idea about what people can do in California. I think you have a particular. Well, we have there's the the California Genetic Privacy uh, Network um, is a project uh, that I, I hope you will come to our website. And uh, uh, there's a lot of good information. Uh, and tell us your stories. Uh, we, we are looking for more and more people to get involved in the network uh, and to participate uh, in the public education that we're doing. There's also a bill, uh, SB 222, uh, that is being sponsored by Senator, California State Senator Alex Padilla. Uh, he was the original sponsor of CalGINA, and he has a, a new piece of, relatively new piece of legislation that would prohibit uh, surreptitious genetic testing in the state of California, meaning that uh, the type of examples we were just giving where somebody would take your, your quote unquote abandoned DNA and, uh, and sequence it for various purposes would be illegal if, the law be if this bill became law. So, so we, uh, uh, we hope you'll support that, that you'll, you'll write uh, to California State Senate, to your individual state senator, uh, and ask them to support that bill. Great, so you're probably seeing people circulating through the aisles and they're grabbing um, questions, so if you haven't had a chance to uh, craft one, uh, please do. So here's, uh, here's a question, you, you touched on a little bit, maybe you can elaborate on this. What does the future hold for DNA biometrics uh, and facial recognition technology combined? Well, DNA is, uh, when you mentioned biometrics, DNA is one form of a biometric. Um, and uh, there have, uh, along with things like facial recognition technology, uh, iris and retinal scans, uh, 
um, uh, and uh, fingerprints, of course. These are all biometrics. Um, and they're already starting to use DNA uh, in various forms as a, as a biometric identifier. The Department of uh, Immigration uh, has already started using DNA in certain circumstances, for example, asylum spe uh, seekers. Uh, they have started to try to take the DNA of asylum seekers to try to trace whether, they, uh, whether they're actually coming from the country they claim they come for when they're seeking asylum. Um, there, of course, have been other plenty of instances where DNA has been taken uh, as a biometric by, by other governments. Um, it was, there was a, in the WikiLeaks, in some of the WikiLeaks leaks, it was discovered that along with NSA tapping, uh, that the U.S. government has try, been collecting the DNA of, of foreign officials for some time. Uh, and so uh, there is, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there, there is a big move to try to find a universal identifier. Um, and of course, unlike a credit card, where you, if you lose it, you can change the number, DNA can never be changed. It's a, it's a, it's a perfect identifier in that way. Uh, and so uh, there have been a, a lot of uh, suggestions made about, about how it might be used, not just by governments, but by commercial companies as a, uh, in place of, of the type of technology that we currently use. Great, so there's a somewhat related question, and it goes back to this idea of abandoned DNA. So when abandoned DNA is collected, how is it known whose it is? And how do you know any one sample isn't contaminated um, with other people's DNA? Great question, and the answer is, without all kinds of controls in place, you don't know. There's a famous case in Germany. It's called the Phantom Killer. And for about 15 years, the police in Germany and in Austria and in other countries had this case of this apparent, of a female who had committed more than about six homicides, had been in several armed robberies, had done all kinds of things, and the murders were sometimes gr gruesome and grisly, and sometimes they were not. There was hardly a pattern. What the pattern was in the DNA. Well, after 15 years, it was discovered that the, the DNA was from the lab technician. <laughs> well, I, I think, it, and I think it's a great example of this mythology of the infallibility of DNA, right? DNA itself may be a very good identifier, but any type of activity that requires human intervention is going to have mistakes by necessity, uh, and. Unfortunately, while we're, we willingly acknowledge mistakes in other types of forensic contexts, there was a, a National Academy of Sciences report that was very condemning of other types of forensic uh, sciences. Uh, for, it, it exempted DNA. It's called DNA the gold standard. And it failed to acknowledge the fact uh, that mistakes are made all the time uh, with DNA evidence, uh, from, the, from the point of collection to the point of processing. Uh, and uh, and unfortunately, those are, are too often uh, downplayed. And I think part of the problem is uh, uh, this, this myth of the infallibility of DNA is that we don't actually, and this is, you know, we talk about how effective DNA is with law enforcement. We don't actually collect information about how effective DNA is in the law enforcement context. Other countries do. The UK, for example, again, they actually m map, uh, track DNA uh, that, from crime scenes that's resulted in a conviction. But we don't do that in the US. As Troy talked about, we talk about matches. And you can have a match at a crime scene from anybody who's been there. Um, and that's the type of numbers that we track in this country. So the numbers that we have on, on, on effectiveness of forensic DNA are highly inflated because they aren't numbers that are tracking how DNA is used to solve crimes. They're simply uh, numbers that track the matches. And those matches are several multitudes more than, than are actually used in any type of a, of a, of a, a crime-solving context. So I'm going to try and crack a couple questions at a time. Just you guys are more than capable of handling this, and I think it will get us an opportunity to move through some of these. So uh, two related questions. How can one find out if their DNA is in a database, such as Kaiser's or a state database? And then more importantly, how do you get it removed? And then the other question is actually related to these direct-to-consumer DNA tests. Uh, questions written, with no living relatives, I'm considering getting uh, a DNA profile made to show my ethnic background, the ethnic background of my forebears. I'm over 75. Is this a bad idea? 
it, it may not be a bad idea, but its execution is almost bound to be problematic. Uh, these tests about ancestry are presuming certain things which are very, very uncertain and problematic. There are two tests which are definitive. One is the Y chromosome, male uh, paternity suits, father's father's father, that's definitive. Mitochondrial DNA on the mother's side, that can be definitive. All the other ancestry tests require something called reference populations. And reference populations are, cho are chosen by the researcher based upon his or her version of what should be the correct reference. Now, it, it turns out that in this country and in other parts of the world, reference populations tend to be ethnic and racial categories. Um, so if you have four grandparents who are from Europe uh, in the major database of Sh uh, Shriver, um, you're, you're seen considered to be well, European ancestry. Uh, four, four ancestors from Asia and so, and so forth. Um, but now the question is whether or not you're picking people from a certain part of the country. Uh, I don't want to get too complicated here. This, an this ancestry testing is a very complicated issue. But it's something called ancestry informative markers, AIMS. And they are used now routinely in medical research for what's called admixture. And they're actually doing work in which they're claiming that the proportional ancestry and a medical condition are related. So it's a quick example, asthma. The idea now uh, from my research colleagues over in UCSF, proportion ancestry of Latinos. If you have more Puerto Rican ancestry than Mexican ancestry and your Latino ethnic makeup, you're said to have a greater probability of having asthma because of the higher proportion of African ancestry in, among Puerto Ricans. This ancestry stuff is very problematic uh, for reasons that have to do with politics and structural issues around migration patterns. So it, it's not a, a bad idea. It's just that uh, what you get back and what you might believe um, are very problematic. In terms of <clears throat> how do you know whether you're in a biobank, well, in many cases, you do not know. Uh, and that's really the problem. There is no transparency uh, as to uh, who's in a biobank. Uh, and unless you, uh, for example, participate in a particular clinical trial where you may know that you volunteered your DNA in that context, you, do, you don't know. Uh, uh, th these are not transparent institutions. Um, and uh, you do not have property rights to your DNA. You don't own your DNA. So uh, while uh, uh, all of this is, is actually determined by contract. So if you, want, if, if you know your DNA is in a database, the best chance of getting it out of that database is whether they violated, violated the contractual terms went for uh, which you gave it in the first place, which is usually unlikely. If you look at the contracts uh, that people uh, sign uh, around uh, genetics research or around direct-to-consumer genetic testing, um, you're really oftentimes giving away the bank uh, when you uh, give your genetics uh, information uh, to some of these institutions. In the direct-to-consumer context, the contractual uh, uh, information uh, that, uh, that appears that you have to sign when you participate um, says that that information is the property of the company, uh, that you don't own it, and that they have the right to use it in various contexts, uh, uh, that they uh, not only do not specify, but even worse, uh, in the commercial context, these contracts are ever-changing. They can change that contract every day. So what you may have understood to be the terms of your relationship with that company on the day you gave them your DNA, uh, that may change because that's the, now their property. So the, 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 what they may reveal as to how they use it could very well change the very next day. And you'll never know uh, uh, unless you happen to go back and check and check the contract, but these contracts, and, I, and I'm an attorney, and, and I don't understand half of these contracts. I mean, these are very long, convoluted uh, uh, contracts that are very poorly drafted. Many of these companies uh, do not have their own lawyers, or if they do, they have one lawyer. Uh, they're, not, they're not sophisticated, um, but they're long, and they are uh, circuitous, and they are very difficult to understand. So again, I'm gonna go with the two questions, and, I, uh, and you'll parse them out as you will.
So the first question is, do you see any legitimate use of DNA capturing to stem the rise of mass killings in our country? And I think that's probably one I suspect that you might want to chew on, Troy, but we'll see. Uh, the other one seems like it's right in your wheelhouse, Jeremy. Has anyone ever successfully identified and challenged genetic discrimination based on GINA? Seems hard to prove, and this idea that it's hard to prove is my understanding that any sort of discrimination suit, you have to prove intent, right? So uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, the first one is rather straightforward. That is, the question has to do with whether or not one could predict from the DNA whether or not one would be a mass killer, and uh, the answer is categorically no. We can't, we, we can't even predict from those who have committed a murder who will be a recidivist, and that's one of the best predictors usually in crime, but uh, it may surprise you to learn that murderers have one of the lowest rates of recidivism of any criminal group. You're much more likely to find recidivism among burglars and car thieves and you know people who ride bicycles on sidewalks. I mean, yeah, um, but recidivism among murderers is rare. Now, if that's the case, then how could one possibly conceptualize a notion that one could go to the DNA, which is a, obviously a minuscule feature of the of a whole genome, and think about predicting mass murder? With regards to GINA, you know, we, we talk about discrimination laws, which are obviously very important, but that's only the beginning of the struggle because uh, uh, the fact that there's a law doesn't mean the, the activity ceases. It simply means, means that there's an opportunity to redress when the activity continues. Uh, and in the context of GINA, uh, Milton, as you, as you said, and this is, this is not just a, a GINA issue, this is, of course, with any discrimination law, discrimination is hard to prove. And the reason it's hard to prove, whether it be employment discrimination or insurance discrimination or really discrimination in any context, is that uh, the entity that is doing the discriminating, the entity that's misusing your information, is the entity that's in complete control of all the information as to what happened. And so how do you know you've been discriminated against? Let's talk about the employment context. Um, there's no legal requirement that an employer tell you why they fired you, why they didn't give you a raise, why they didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, give you uh, a step up to the next to a, to a new position. Um, and so, how do you know that your genetic information was the underlying context for that decision making? Well, in many cases you don't know. Uh, and in discrimination law, in particular, oftentimes you have to identify a pattern or practice where this has happened multiple times uh, to, to a point of where you can actually identify that something bad has happened. Um, in the context of GINA, we've already seen uh, every year there have been several hundred cases um, that have been uh, filed under GINA since it became law. Um, the employment cases go through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, so we actually have some good data as to the number of cases uh, that are a uh, number of complaints that are being filed and, and legitimized by that agency. Um, and we are seeing cases not just of uh, misuse of genetic information. Uh, there were two cases that the EEOC um, publicized just this May uh, where uh, companies had been uh, improperly collecting genetic information despite GINA. Um, and, uh, uh, there have been cases of discrimination. There was a, a woman in Connecticut by the name of Pamela Fink, and uh, she had uh, had a positive uh, 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 BRCA test. This is the, the breast the gene that's been associated with high, uh, elevated rates of breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, and uh, she was uh, going to, to get uh, additional testing and, and treatment, um, and uh, her employer fired her. And this was with gene in place. These cases happen. Yeah. I just want to add a footnote. Uh, surprised that Jeremy didn't mention it since he's an attorney. But for the last 25 years, the Supreme Court has eroded uh, the capacity to, to uh, use discrimination because of something called the erosion of disparate impact. You have to show intent. You have to show that there was actually some memo, some activity, which indicated that the institution intended to discriminate. 30 years ago, you could use disparate impact. You could say, we see a pattern in this fire department that they've hired no members of a particular minority over a 50-year period. And so that's evidence on the face of it, disparate impact of, this, of these sets of, of practices. Uh, with the intent doctrine now as the, at the core, 
uh, the courts have now ruled you have to show that they actually intend it. Now you imagine what you would need with genetic discrimination to show intent. Now the, 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 one of the valuable things about GINA is that while that's the case with the discrimination provisions, the privacy provisions do not require intent. So the fact that the employer acquired genetic information in violation of GINA uh, does not require intent at all. In fact, the federal agencies uh, such as the EEOC that have put out regulations regarding GINA have actually put proactive requirements on behalf of employers to, to offer them safe havens because there uh, is no intent requirement. So for example, employers now under GINA, if they want to, uh, if, if they have a legal uh, right to ask for medical records, for example, you're, you're taking, you want to take leave under the FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, and you, you're making a request and they have an opportunity to actually request certain medical records under the, in, in those types of contexts. Uh, the employer is actually legally required now by GINA to tell the, uh, the doctor or the hospital to redact genetic information from whatever information is given them. So the privacy provisions uh, are, are, are very strong in GINA, but they're limited to health insurance and employment. And as Troy said, the discrimination provisions are still very hard to enforce. So I think we're out of time, and I'm going to hand it back over to Dana in just a moment. But I want to thank you both for a really stimulating and thought-provoking um, exchange. I want to invite up um, one more guest from Breast Cancer Action, Karuna, um, who's going to talk a little bit about what Breast Cancer Action is doing right now and information that we have um, to, to take action and to inform ourselves. Well, thanks so much for having me. And again, I want to thank the panelists for this really interesting and important um, discussion tonight. I, oh, good, I'm not scrolling through up here on the on the keyboard. So um, you've talked a lot about the law enforcement aspect of genetic privacy. And as Breast Cancer Action, I'm really here to talk, my, my knowledge is more in the area of the medical side, the healthcare side. Um, and I want to recognize, let me tell you a little bit about Breast Cancer Action and why I'm here. Um, we are the watchdog for the breast cancer movement. Our mission is to achieve health justice for women at risk of and living with breast cancer. And we were one of the co-plaintiffs on the lawsuit challenging one company, Mary Genetics, patents on the human BRCA1 and 2 genes, which Jeremy referenced. These are the genes that all of us have, and that for some people, um, maybe one in 600 people, um, there is a mutation that is known to be linked to an increased risk of breast, ovarian, and some other cancers. And so when one company obtained a patent on uh, these genes, not only did that mean that there was a, um, a monopoly on commercial testing, women couldn't get second opinions, it also limited the access of scientists and researchers to do research in this area, in particular around targeted therapies. So it had dramatic impact on uh, families at increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer because this monopoly me meant the cost of the test was very high and this information is potentially life-saving. So there's a, I, this is why I'm here. So there's a lot of wonderful and important information that we talked about tonight that I'd be eager to dig into. But I think in terms of how we as a community can take action, we are Breast Cancer Action. We're a watchdog organization, we're a grassroots activist organization, and we know that working together we can achieve change. So I'm here to offer some suggestions for things that we can do. And I think that places for action really um, vary. So on the one hand, there's choices that we make as individuals, and on the other hand, there's our regulatory system, our legal and regulatory system. And I want to, you know, uh, kind of, again, recognize Jeremy for his leadership around GINA, um, acknowledge the gaps in our existing laws and regulations, and I think some really important issues have been raised around how do, uh, how do different entities gain access to our genetic information? How is that information controlled? Um, you know, what are the consent procedures? All the things that were raised around discarded DNA. So there's clearly important work to be done around the legal and regulatory side of genetic testing and genetic access. 
um, on the on the personal side where we may make choices that influence or, or determine um, access to our own DNA, you know, this is a tricky one. We've talked about law enforcement where people don't have choice. And in the medical context, the choice is sort of tricky, right? You know, we've, we've acknowledged that many consent procedures are sorely lacking, um, that, you know, after a person may give consent for a particular use of their DNA, their DNA may then be used in multiple other ways. Consent procedures change. There's a lot to talk about here, and so I do want to, um, you know, make a plea that you read your consent forms and that you question um, genetic testing and consider not doing something like a 23andMe, you know, test for fun. Um, we ha I have some materials outside that, you know, talk more about um, the issue that Jeremy was raising, where really our payment to many of these direct-to-consumer companies is not the $100 fee, it's our bio data, it's our family histories and the, the genetic information that these companies are obtaining and hoping to monetize. Um, so educate yourselves and others about the, the limits and the potential harms of these tests. And, um, and, and I think if you are considering a genetic test for medical reasons, really insist on independent genetic counseling. I think this is, this is really critical. So if we've got the legal and regulatory and we've got the places where we can personally make some choices, the last place I wanna talk about is the place that Breast Cancer Action does most of our work and this is really around the corporate accountability piece. And um, there's two things I wanna say. One is all of us in the public, when we see some of the fear mongering and disease mongering direct cons to consumer marketing, we can challenge that and call that out and hold those companies accountable, and I encourage us to do so. I think that there are many cases of companies overstating the claims of their tests and really um, trying, to, trying to grow their market um, and, and to make money and to acquire more data. Um, for companies or for labs that are doing genetic testing, there's, I would argue, five key questions that we need to, to pose. The first, which we haven't talked about at all here, but is really important when we're looking at the BRCA tests and when we're looking at the direct-to-consumer tests, is this question of data validation. Are the methods and the claims properly validated so that we know that what the companies are telling us are in fact true? So that with BRCA mutations, um, women are do removing healthy organs based on, on positive findings. We need to know that those findings are in fact accurate and, and have been validated independently. Um, secondly, what are the labs doing with the genetic material and biodata they collect? These are many of the issues that were raised here tonight, so I'm going to move on quickly. Thirdly, how do these labs contribute to open access databases? I have an op-ed out on the table out there that, that really argues that we need to treat our genetic, wh when we contribute our data to, um, when, we, when, we, when we contribute our data through medical testing, that should be, we should follow medical ethics standards. This should not be, our, our, our DNA should not be hoarded by private companies for private use, but any DNA that is retained and has been properly consented should be used for the benefit of humankind and for the benefit of the scientific and medical community in ways that protect our anonymity. And, and, and you know, we do gain scientific and medical research through genetic testing, but this data needs to be accessible through these properly anonymized open access databases for the benefit of the scientific and medical community rather than hoarded privately by, by labs and companies. Fourthly, um, I already raised the question of independent genetic counseling, but any genetic testing really needs to be accompanied by independent genetic counseling. This is vital. Um, Jeremy and I had a conversation before this panel about uh, the harms and limits of genetic tests and the fact that, you know, there are, the people are getting genetic tests without understanding those limits. And once they have that knowledge, they can't put it back. <laughs> the genie is out and they wish they didn't have it and it affects generations to come. Um, we know stories of doctors who prescribe particular genetic tests and because they're not genetic counselors, it's the wrong genetic test and so it's effectively a false negative. So independent genetic counseling is really important if you're considering a medical um, uh, genetic test. And I think that the fifth case, which really gets, uh, all of these do, but 
again, gets back to this question of social justice, or what are the cost controls in place? And how are these labs ensuring that people who potentially need these tests have access? Again, looking at the BRCA cases, we're talking about tests that are potentially life-saving for those families. Um, and and you know, cost control needs to be a factor as we work to ensure that our, 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 our public health system, our medical system, works for people and puts people's interests before corporate profits. So with that in mind, those are, are some of the ways in which I think we can work together to create change to ensure that our um, that, that this, this frontier of genetic testing and genetic information is properly regulated, controlled, maintained in ways that, that work for us, work for the people. Um, so thank you very much for, um, for joining us tonight and for, for being part of this panel. I know that I, for one, have, you know, working in breast cancer action, I try to talk about gene patents and Oftentimes, people just want to plug their ears, close their eyes, and blah, 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 ignore the issue, which seems too complex. So it's really wonderful to see so many people out here tonight understanding why this matters for all of us. Again, I, I want to encourage everybody um, to go to uh, our project website, the California Genetic Privacy Network. It's geneticprivacynetwork.org. Uh, and it contains information about all the laws uh, that we talked about and others that we may not have talked about uh, tonight. Uh, many of the instances uh, where you are protected, where you are not protected, and additional uh, resources and suggestions uh, for what you can do to protect yourself, uh, as well as stories of people who've been affected uh, by genetic privacy and, and discrimination in various ways. So I encourage you to go to geneticprivacynetwork.org uh, and, and encourage your, your friends and neighbors to, to learn more because I think the best way to protect yourself is to educate yourself, is to understand where you're protected, where you're not protected, um, and to make informed decisions about uh, how you use your DNA. All right, thank you everyone. Um, there are hats at the door if you haven't given a donation. And April 30th, we're gonna be back here. It's a Wednesday night for GMOs 2.0, Synthetic Biology, Food, and Farming. It'll be a, a good one, so please be sure to come back. Thank you very much. Safe travels home, everybody.